It's at Love Clark. I'm back with the Sandos in America and abroad history and uh, family discussion with this book by Marie Sandos. This is for the Sandos family. And um, it's called, as you know, Old Jewels. Okay, so by Marie Sandos. Okay. We're going to start chapter one and read this part. The people. Old Jules. Jules Amy Sandos. His sweetheart, Rosalie. His wife's Estelle. Henriette. Amelia. And Mary. So he had a lot of wives. His parents, children, brothers, sisters, uncles, cousins, and ten fourth. The doctor, Dr. Walter Reed. The man with the Winchester, Gentleman Jim. The two friends, Johnny Jones and Elmer Sturgeon. The two jesters, Paul Nicolette and Jules. Tim Scott Tissot The Roadhouse Keepers Jacob Schwartz His Sons and Daughters The Two Killers Dave Tate and Ralph Neiman, Newman, Newman The Cattlemen Richards and Comstack Modisette the region, the upper Nyabura country, the hard land, table, the river, and the hills. Chapter 1 of Old Jules Spring The border towns of Rock and Cherry counties were shaking off the dullness of winter. Galloping hooves, the beam of the 44, and the measured beat of the spike mall awaken the narrow single streets running between the tents and shacks. Sky pilots plodded from town to town, preaching a scorching and violent hell. But west of there, the monotonous yellow sand hills unobtrusively soaked up the soggy patches of April snow. Fringes of yellow-green crept down the south slopes, a ram brilliant emerald over the long blackened strips left by the late prairie fires that burned unchallenged until the wind drove the flames upon their own ashes or the snow fell. All winter the wind had torn at the fire-barred knolls, shifting but not changing the unalterable sameness of the hills that spread in rolling swells westward to the hardland country of the Nyabora River, where deer and antelope grazed almost undisturbed except by an occasional hunting party. By now the grass was started. Out of the east crawled the black path of the railroad. Colonies of homesteaders, home seekers, in covered wagons, pushed westward. From the plains of Texas, a hundred thousand head of cattle came, their feet set upon the long trails to the free range lands. In the deep canyons of the Nyabora, wolves and rustlers skulked, waiting while three or four ranchers, already in the hills, armed themselves for the conflict. And out of the east came a lone man in an open wagon, driving hard. Jules hunched down on the wagon seat, a rifle between his knees. Followed up the north fringe of the river bluffs from the little town of Verdigre, 
the Degre, near the Missouri. For three days he had whipped his tired team onward, always with impatience, as though tomorrow would be too late. But there was really no hurry. His Swiss-made map showed the sand hills and a wilderness that many small lakes and streams remote uninhabited with many small lakes and streams ro remote uninhabited wild fruit game and free land far from the law and convention there a man could build a home hunt and trap in peace live as he liked little about this dark bearded young man and ragged camp stained clothing suggested the dapper student who swaggered the streets of Zurich three years earlier, whose shave was as necessary as breakfast, an old cap, greasy and scorched from service and pan lifting, sat low upon eyes as strange and changing as the Jora that towered over his homeland. They were gray and glowed at a lusty story well told withdrew in remote contemplation of the world and the universe, or flashed with the swift anger and violence of summer lightning. At twenty-two, after four years of med school, medical school, Jules instigated another of his periodic scenes. A larger allowance was the pretext. Three thousand francs was not enough for the son of a gentleman in the university. Would they have him clean his own shoes? This time, he aroused more than his mother's short-lipped anger. That always ended in tearful yielding to his, this eldest and most beloved son. His father's anger broke through a military restraint. So the fine jewels would play the millionaire? Did he forget that there were yet five brothers and young Elvina to be fed? and clothed and educated perhaps it would be well if he learned to clean his own shoes the son stood up to the father were the summer months were the summer months he spent as rail, railway mail clerk a life fit only for the slow wits of a stable hand at as nothing yes his allowance had been increased, but he knew why. To separate him from the little Rosalie, who worked beside him in the mail service and who was not considered good enough for one of a family celebrating the 400th year of its foundation, they would have finer daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law, very well. Let their favorites, Paul and Henry and Nan, Nana, bring, Nana, bring them. He, Jules, would go to America, and he would take the Rosalie with him. But as his father predicted, the little Rosalie would not go. He left his home on the blue waters of Lake Neuchatel alone, crossed the sea, and came as far west as his money permitted to northeastern Nebraska. There he filed on a homestead and became a landed man. With twenty dollars, a stamp collection begun as a boy, a Swiss Army rifle, and a spade. Letters in French and full of this wonderful country crossed the sea to Rosalie. She answered affectionately, but she still could not bring herself to follow her jewels to an American frontier farm, pointing out instead their total unfitness for peasant life. So, after three years of disappointment, Jules married the first woman that would have him. When the young wife, Estelle, refused to build the morning fires to run through the frosty grass to catch up his team, Jules closed her mouth with a flat of his long, muscular hand, dumped their, imp dumped their supply of flour and sugar to the old sow and pigs, and loaded his belongings upon, upon the wagon to leave her and Knox County behind him forever. Because in 
1884, Valentine was the land office for the great expanse of free land to the west and south. Jules stopped there. The town was also the end of the railroad and the station of supply and diversion for the track crews, pushing the black rails westward for the military post of Fort Nibora and Fort Robinson for the range country and for the mining camps of the Black Hills. Sue came in every Sue came in every day from the great reservations to the north. Warriors who as late as seventy seven and eighty one had fought with Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. Law was remote and the broken hills of the Sioux blankets offered safe retreat for horse thief and road agent and killer. Because the town was probably full of thieves, Jules camped in the sparse timber of the river valley. After a supper of antelope steak, he, he kicked the coals from his fire and climbed the hills toward the double row of lighted windows. The, the flat plain of Valentine was dotted with the dark bulks of covered wagons, hungry oxen, picketed horses, settler caravans, and freighters freighters camped for the night in their push westward. Jules stopped to talk to a knot of silent men squatting fr around a fire. Germans, they told them at last, going to the north table two days out. They started curiously at they stared curiously at the dark bearded young man, tall in the gleam of the fire, fine long hands and delicate wrists dangling from shrunken coat sleeves. Ja! They had heard of the sand hills. They sucked loudly at their pipes when he said he would go there. Seeing Jules left them and went down the one street of Valentine, he dodged behind the horse-lined hitch racks. At a dozen galloping cowboy, as a dozen galloping cowboys came into view, into town, yelling, shooting red streaks through the darkening sky, stirring up a dust that shimmered golden in the squares of light that spilled from the tents and shacks. In the doorway of the largest saloon and gambling house between O'Neill and the Black Hills, the home seeker hesitated. Despite the blaze of tin lamp reflections along the walls, the interior was murky heavy with the stench of stale alcohol and the winter-long unbathed humanity. Restless layers of smoke crept over the heads of the crowd. Hats pushed back their hands on their hips. The frontiersmen listened to a short, stocky man sitting on the wet bar, their narrow eyes moving covertly over their neighbors. Jules edged closer with the other newcomers to listen to the strange American words. It seemed that the stocky man brought news. The vigilantes down the Nyabora were riding again. That meant, he reminded his listeners, a cottonwood, a bridge, or a telegraph pole, and a chunk of rope for somebody. The vigilantes had come as far west as Valentine before, taken men away and left them dangling for the buzzards. They took Kid Wade from the sheriff at Bassett only months ago, hung him to a telegraph pole, and sold the rope at fifty cents an inch. They said he was a horse thief. That dodge always worked. Now the vigilantes were riding again, All, and all opposition would be taken care of in the usual way. Jules looked curiously into the frightened faces of the land seekers about him and stared, started away to buy a glass of beer. It was all just another joke on the greenhorns, and soon the laughing would begin. At the bar, a half drunken youth, several years younger than Jules, was talking big. Let the vigs come. We'll make them eat lead. He drawled and spit into the sawdust at his feet. 
Shut that running off the mouth slip, a whisper warned somewhere near Jules. The youth called Slip poured himself another glass of whiskey, running it over. He gulped the liquid and spat again. I ain't afraid of any goddamn vaggies, he told, he told them all, and his hand on his heavy cartridge belt. A shot set the glasses and bottles to ringing and startled a wave of relief of relieved talk and natural laughter as Slip turned and set his glass back upon the bar. A mushroom of powder smoke rose from the crowd and crept lazily toward the dark rafters. Jules laughed too now, not as the others, but with keen enjoyment. This was as the shooting this was as the shooting through the darkness outside a show the Wild West of which he had read with a great smell of powder and brag. It was fine. Then he stopped a little s then he stopped a little sick. The youth was bending low over the bar, and from his mouth ran a string of frothy blood. Slowly he went down his fingers sliding from the boards. The sun blackened men about him melted back, their hands frankly on their gans now. A hunchback and a negro pushed between them, carrying the sagging figure out. The swinging doors came to rest behind them, and still no boot creaked. At a shoulder signal from the bartender, two men finally pushed forward, pounding empty glasses on the wet wood. Gradually, the front line crumbled, glasses clinked, while one after another the newcomers escaped into the night. A blond bearded Polander climbed upon a barrel and pulled away at a red accordion. Two girls came out of the boxes at the back and slipped companionably into the double line at the bar. Gradually the crowd thickened again. Everything was as usual. Bewildered and angry at this, his first death, Jules let himself down into the handiest chair. Across the pine table from him sat a man twisting a finger into his walrus mustache, engrossed in his own thought, in a mug of beer. But will the officials not try to apprehend the murderer? Look him up, the newcomer finally demanded, in the stilted English of the foreigner. A heavy eyelid went up slowly and came down. Taint healthy, Times like this to be too interested in the remains, nor anybody what might have been involved. The man stopped, fished in his sagging pocket, and brought up some newspaper clippings. Shaking out the tobacco, he handed them across the table. Cautiously, Jules took them and read of the surprising activities of the vigilantes while the men talked on. From the St. Paul photograph, February 15th. And 29th, 1884. Transgressors dealt with by vigilantes. Reports have reached here from the upper Eklon, Elkhorn country in Nebraska that Kid Wade, DEA, or of the Nebraska outlaws and horse thieves, has been hung by vigilantes who have headquartered at a place called the Pen. At the month-long pine, they have arrested a large number of men in various parts of northern Nebraska and taken them away from the place where they had tried and disposed in the manner of unknown. But as they are never seen again, it is supposed they are shot, hanged, or conducted out of the country. The terrible earnestness of the vigilantes and the mystery of their ways cause men to shudder when their doings are mentioned. It is positively certain that they have lynched eleven men, and it is equally sure that others have met the same fate, but how many, or by what means, only the grim executioners can tell. Kid Wade was captured at Lamar's three weeks ago. He seemed to realize the fate that awaited him, but manifested no more concern than if going about his ordinary business. Long Pine, February 7th. Kid Wade was found this morning hanging to a whistle post ten miles east of Long Pines. 
Coroner Shefford Shefford of Long Pine held an in inquest today and found that he came to his death by hanging by parties unknown. The vigilantes left th this place yesterday morning with Wade. The sheriff of Holt County took him from them, but on the, the way to Holt County, ten or fifteen masked men took Wade from the sheriff. Vigilante Law in Cherry County, Sioux City, February 16th. Sheriff Carter of Cherry County, Nebraska, has been notified by the Vigilante Committee to leave the county immediately. The Vigilante claimed that he is in conclusion with the Nebraska horse thieves beyond a doubt. Sheriff Carter announces a fixed determination to stay, denies the charges made against him, and has sworn a... and has sworn in a posse of 30 men for his protection. The sheriff and his men are all armed to the teeth, awaiting hostilities. The leader of the vigilante has posted up a notice that no man living can escape their vi vengeance, least of all Sheriff Carter. Further developments are anxiously awaited. Kids like that slip there that what steals maybe a ham string and shoots off their mouth got no business in this man's country, Frenchy. Of course, most of it's just liquored up track hands and cowboys and soldiers or reservation bucks. But there's horse stealing, rustling, and skin games going, con games going contest constant. Then. Dropping his voice, of course, there's our vidges. It, it is so. Jules tapping the clippings. Yeah, claiming the courts is in run by crooks. No protection for their stock or lives. The man turned his head over a thick shoulder and looked about. I guess I, guess it ain't no secret, but the county judge and the sheriff is supposed to own every sliver in this goddamn dump. The Vigis has ordered the sheriff to leave the county. He swears in a posse of 30 men with Winchesters and await development and awaits developments. Could this be so? Wondering what his father would say, the recent citizen of the orderly, uneventful little Swiss Republic leaned upon his fold his arm folded arms and considered these people more closely. In that packed room, only one man stood out. He was alone at a corner table with a rifle standing in the crook of his arm, the barrel against his young beard, his dark hair turning up in silky drakes, tails under the large belly tan hat. His legs were exceedingly long, so long that his fine, soft boots extended out upon the floor beyond the small table. But no one bumped against him, and no one sat with him. Undisturbed aloof, he sipped a small glass of whiskey. Yeah, the old freighter made the, made the most of his fr fresh audience. Like the paper says the other morning, there's a notice tacked up on this shack, mind you, saying that the vidges got what they hair, what their hair after, what the what hair their days after. So, so far nothing's happened, as I know, unless he jerked a stabby thumb towards the doors. But do the people here believe the vigilantes are always right? The man choked, sputtering beer through his mustaches. Right? Who's stopping to ask about right if they has the crack shots on their side? So that was how it went here. Jules ordered two beers. The country west, the old-timer dismissed with a grain. 
with the grand sweep of his replenished mug. No count unless you've got money enough to start a cow outfit and guns enough to fight the rustlers off. Starved to death farming. Never rains, cold, as blazes in winter. They brought a feller up from the lake country south of here in the last week. Both hands froze, fingers rotting off. Crazy as a shit poke. Jules, who never listened to what he would not hear, rose abruptly and took a turn through the crowd, wishing he had brought one of his own guns with him instead of hiding both the rifle and his second-hand tin bore in the buck brush along the river. He pushed away a girl who put her arm about his shoulder. There was no telling, probably diseased. He took no chances. The man with the rifle was still there, turning the tiny glass between his lean brown fingers, watching the light in the amber liquid. One man outfit! The freighter had called him. Not running with no pack here. Jules was not quite certain what these phrases meant, but there was something about the man. Not even the women wandering about with large mouth laughter in search of pay dirt went near him. In the glare of the tin reflectors, The blued barrel of his Winchester gleamed. A repeater, a beautiful weapon, a true vessel, is beautiful. As true still is beautiful, excuse me. To avoid the milling, dusty street, Jules cut around the corner of the saloon and stumbled over something. A man stiff and cold. Probably the youth who defied the vigilantes, chilling for shipment home. The home seeker pressed his back against the board wall for a moment. Inside the, inside the Polander was still sweating over a fast polka. Boot stomped while far away a revolver echoed twice. Followed by a yank, yee-haw, faint, yee-haw. Jules touched the dark bolt with his foot. Sometimes the sparrow, like the eagle, dies far from his nest. But only a m most important man, a general or a senator, would be shipped across the sea. He scratched his beard, surely digging would be easier in the sand hills than in the stony gravels of Neuchatel, and if there was none to wield the spade, the wolves would clean the bones well. Shivering a little, he slipped away into the pitchy darkness. Back at his wagon, Jules pulled the Viterelli from his digging place in the, br in the buck brush. He raised it to his shoulder several times. The gun came up well, but it was only a single shot. Heavily, he crept into his bedroll. The next day, he tried to trade the old Swiss rifle for a second-hand Winchester, but such guns were in great demand on the, were in great demand on the border, and there were other needs for the forty dollars remaining for the, from the relinquishment of his Knox County claim. There would be much to buy, farm tools, seed, food, ammunition, shoes, drugs, all the things of life in a new land. The old storekeeper puttered about among his stacks of gaudy Indian goods, the thick wool woolens he kept for the freighters and the le leathers for the ranch hands. Finally, he took Jules into a back room and showed him the bales of furs cut up, the, cut up the Niobora by Indian and white trappers. Beaver, mink, an occasional otter, endless muskrats, not worth more than eight or ten cents, skunk, coyotes, gray wolves, and badgers from the bluffs and hills. But beaver and otter, those were the furs. So, 
jewels added a dozen steel traps to his supplies and a book on trapping and first aid for the frontiersmen. He obtained plats and information at the land office, listened with interest to the story of a hard land region west of the sand hills, and made arrangements to have all mail held until he returned. That might be a long time, feller. Lots of things can happen out where you're going, the postmaster commented dryly. I'm a crack shot, Jules told him stiffly. Oh, are you? Oh, are you? The man looked the camp stained home keeper up and down, home seeker up and down. There's other things catching where you're going besides lead, Colic. But, Lee Colic. But, he made a note of the mail instructions and struck the paper on the last of the long row of spikes jammed full of similar slips. Jules wrote letters to his friends in Knox County. Young professional men, a doctor, a lawyer, an architect, all who had come across the sea in, an in answer to his earlier letters. They had been disappointed in America, but now he would lead them to a better land. And last, he wrote a letter to Rosalie, dropped a blob of red wax upon the flap and pressed it down with his grandfather's seal. A man with a seedling true standing on newly plowed ground, facing the rising sun. Then once more, Jules set his face westward. Every day the country grew more monotonous. The gash cut by the Niobora sank deep between sandstone and magnesia white bluffs. The grass was longer, yellower, less washed by the winter snows. Because the bluffs crowded, Close to the stream, the home seeker kept out of the valley, only descending into it for water and wood. The washed ruts of the army trail leading west to Fort Robinson did not did not interest him. There would be less game along the trail, and less freedom on land within sight of troops. The days brought pale, wind-streaked skies, yellow coyotes slinking into gullies, and endless small game, rabbits, grouse, kill, quail. Wedges of wild geese honked their way north, and along the river the swift wings of ducks whistled over the brush in the clear sand-bottom stream. He saw many antelope and deer, and one morning a large dun animal with high shoulders and broad Pronged antlers grazed peacefully against the higher reaches of the sparsely timbered hillside. An elk. The young hunters viturally came up and then dropped, stalked down to the ground, arms crossed over the muzzle. Jules watched the beautiful animal, so nearly the color of the grassy slope that it vanished and less silhouetted against the dark green of the pines. At last he slipped away. Towards noon, a yellowish haze crept up the horizon. The wind rose in panting gusts, settled in a steady push, almost as tangible as a wall. The flying sand cut the man's face. Despite the sharp, sharp lashed whip, the horses turned their tails into the wind. Finally, Jules gave up unhitched and slept away the day behind a sandstone cliff over the river. The next morning was still and clear, and the rested horses set off on a trot that soon slowed to a walk in the loose sand, hot deep, blown from bare stretches over the grass. But the wind uprooted trees. The denuded knolls brought only a grunt from the home seeker. He refused to see any significance in them. Instead, he considered the coming pres presidential election. Cleveland, the governor of New York, was an aggressive young Democrat. If nominated, he would carry the election, build up world trade, bring good times for the poor man. Without tariff, there would be no international conflicts, no wars. That reminded him of Estelle, 
in Knox County. Lazy good-for-nothing didn't want to raise children. So long as there were wars, it was woman's duty to make soldiers. In the meantime, an iridescent bluish, bluish yellow streak began to smudge the northwest horizon. It lifted like a delicate puffball spread trail trailing across the hills. Jules pushed his cap back and pounded his team toward the running water. At the first whiff of smoke, the team plunged forward down into the steep river canyon. The sudden lurch threw Jules forward almost over the dash. The wagon seat bounced off the bedroll, whirling after it. The wagon teetered on two wheels and then went over, throwing the man into the shallow sandy river. He got up, flung the water from his eyes, and looked, in, looked to his team. Heaving down in the har harness on a sandbar, but unhurt while on the bluff above them, five antelope ran swiftly before the fire. Jules looked after them, pulled his wet pants ruefully from his thighs, and started the disagreeable task of untangling the team. Whoa, 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 he kept saying nervously, only confident of his command over such powerful muscles as those of a horse when seated in the wagon and armed with a long-lashed whip. When the horses were free and the scattered goods collected, Jules built up a big fire and wrapped himself in a blanket like a Sioux Indian he had seen at Valentine. While his clothes steamed on the leafless chokeberry bush near the flames, he heated a pail of water and poured it boiling through his guns. The Viterelli particularly must not rust. All next day, the home seeker pushed on through the fire blackened region. Here and there, a soapweed butt twisted a rarely visible thread of smoke into the still air. There was no game, not even a snowbird, and for three days, Jules had no word with a fellow man. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry for an interruption. He was following the army trail now, but it stretched away before him, as empty as the burnt prairie. Once he looked back, contemplating return to Valentine, then he swung his whip and pushed onward. Suddenly, the country was grassed again. The home seeker climbed off his wagon. The home seeker climbed off his wagon to kick the soil, to smell it, to feel it between his fingers. Carefully, he measured the dry sunflower stalks that rattled in the wind and sent and went on. Finally, he saw a little half soddy, half dugout beside the trail. No horse, no cow, no strip of, of breaking. Only the little door and half window with the crooked rusty stovepipe pushing up through the sod-covered roof. A middle-aged Swede looked out reluctantly at the man's n knock. I don't speak English, he kept repeating through the crack of door doorway. At a particularly at a particularly little level little flat about two miles long, Joel stopped again. Good ground, but only enough for m one. He would go on. What was the time? Not yet May. Too cold for growing crops. Every day the wind's song was louder, the air drier, the sun glare brighter on the s sandy stretches. Squinting his eyes over the map, he fought to, fold, fought to hold together in the wind. He moved his fingers westward along the Niobora. The country was getting high, approximately 3,500 to 4,000 4, feet, 
and still the sunflowers grew, and the grapevines were knotted with flower buds along the river. He developed a tendency to undershoot and let a yearling antelope get away before he could reload. A little lift to the, a little lift to the site. Remember, a little lift to the site remedied that. A good rifle, this Vertorelli, for now, but a Winchester repeater. That was the gun. With it, a wolf or a man could be killed a long way off. Never know what hit him. Who needed the protection of law and government with such a gun? He knew it could not be far to the hard land beyond the hills now. With the rifle barrel against his shoulder as the man in the saloon at Valentine's held his, the home seeker said, sang Margarita, a love song he used to sing to, he used to sing to Rosalie in the cool green woods of Switzerland on Sunday afternoons. With a sudden sputter he stopped. She had refused to come to him. She wouldn't be any use to him no more than Estelle, but there was no denying that she was the best comrade he had ever known. Long, fine hands, dark, curly brown clustered at, ha curly hair clustered at her neck. A sharp, clear mind. It could not be that he would never s see her again. The horses trudged on in a slow walk, the yellow sand following, the iron tires and dropping back in the iron tires and dropping back into the tracks with a soft song. Twice the next day, retreating wagons crept eastward to, towards Jules. Both times, the defeated home seekers stopped to warn him. The cattlemen will have this land, all of it. Jules patted the look, lock of his gun. Eh? I won't scare out. But it was the most dangerous. It was most dangerous to remain. Two settlers who refused to scare out were hung and then burned to death. Oh, you mean Mitchell and Ketchum, killed down in Custer County? Jules spit into the sound. Where you hear this? Cowboys at the Hunter Ranch, twelve miles up the river. So? Joel scratched his head, stopped, took the shell from his gun, and looked through the barrel carefully. Not a speck of powder suit marred the gleaming chamber. It seemed that the cowboys were only scaring the greenhorns, but he had thought the same thing in the saloon at Valentine. Clashes would come when men would be needed. Men who would carry Winchesters and shoot straight to kill. Jules gathered up his lines. He would camp at the hunter ranch that night. An hour later, he saw a small bunch of cattle grazing along the hillside, and for a moment a rider stood black against the light horizon. Later, he saw more cattle, and finally he struck the traveled army trail that dipped deep into the river valley, past a long house and some outbuildings. Snuggled against a bluff half hidden by bare trees. As he opened the wire gate, an eagle circled high over the bluffs. Making sure we're on the right page. Eagle circled high over the bluffs, a tiny splash of black in the evening sky. He shot once and watched the eagle slant and fall. A man at the barn looked up at the report. Not bad, old timer. Not so damn bad, he called. Unhitch! There were only two men at the ranch until after dark, both of them old Texas trail drivers. And while they did a lot of laughing at this fr foreigner who expected to grow corn here, they made no attempt to scare him with murder tales. Sir, you're going up to the flats? Great farming country. 
never get your crops wet there. The cook told the homeseeker as he lifted the pan of squaw bread off the stove and spit his tobacco into the fire. Jules speared a chunk of the brown fried dough from the pan and laughed. After dark, the taller man took a lantern from a rafter, lit it, and went out. Snubs it to a tree on top of the bluff so them riders what's coming in can see where the ranch is. Can't get a glim of light from down here for as far as you can smell a lily in a nest of skunks, the cook explained. Oh-ho! An hour later, three men came in, blinking narrow eyes and wind-weathered faces. Perched on their haunches along the smoky wall, they ate thick slabs of fried beef and squaw bread and drank ten cans of black coffee, boiling hot, for the evening air was chilly. Then, with a few words and a lot of unjustified laughing, they told Jules to turn in anywheres and crawled into bunks at the far end of the room. At daylight, they were out. Soon after sunup, all but the cook loped away. Jules left, too, a little disgruntled. He had slept with his rifle by his side, but no one had disturbed him. Now the sand hills flattened away to buffalo grass flats. Last year's sunflowers stood. Last year's sunflowers stood taller their stalks thicker, sturdier. Jules climbed off his wagon. His study of government bulletins, his knowledge of botany in the old country, convinced him that that where some flowers grew, corn will also grow. And except for the few cowboys at the hunter ranch, the country was open, free. The grass was almost untouched. Cow chips, rare. About two o'clock on the afternoon of the 20th of April, the day before Jules' 25th birthday, which he had completely forgotten, the hills gave way, and before him was the silver ribbon of the Nyabora, the wooded slopes, barely tinged with palest green, topped by yellowish sandstone bluffs. Farther on was a plain flatter than the palm of a man's hand and reaching into the dim blue hazes each way. Far off to the left was a with a flat butt box like. To the extreme right were low hills similar to those left behind but the land straight ahead the flats as the hunter cook called it was absolutely bare without a house even a tree a faint yellow green that broke here and there into shifting aspects of small shimmering lakes rudimentary mirages there close enough to the river for game and wood on the hard land that must be black and fertile where corn and fruit trees would surely grow well Jules saw his home and around him a community of his countrymen and other home seekers Refugees from oppression and poverty intermingled in peace and contentment. There would grow up a place of orderliness, with sturdy women and strong children to swing the hay fork and the hoe, leaning upon his vert, 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 veterally, excuse me, leaning upon his veterally, his cap pushed far back from his eyes. He surveyed the running water, his new homeland. If you like that, we're going to chapter two next. Okay.